Okay, good morning, everyone. We are gonna kick off this. Um, I'd, I'd thank you everybody for coming. I know that it's early and um, well, early for some, I know we're all on different time zones here, but we are very happy to have you. And our, um, I'm gonna get going fast because we have some people with some time restrictions and I'm gonna introduce our first authors, which are Mickey Daughtry and Rachel Lippincott. Uh, they are the best-selling authors of Five Feet Apart and they're going to talk a bit about their next collaboration all this time. If I can get them unmuted. Isn't technical. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was desperately mute. mute. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for being here and letting us uh, come and present our new book all this time. Absolutely. We have, uh, I'm Mickey. And I'm Rachel. There's Rachel. <laughs> um, we have been struggling with how to pitch this book and we're really, really happy this time because it's a bunch of booksellers and people we don't have to uh, hide spoilers from. So, uh, what this book is about, and we're just going to give away the spoilers just so you know, because we want you to be able to sell it open, you know, and be able to get it out there for us. And we really appreciate that. It is a book about Kyle and Marley. It is uh, structured in a fairy tale format. So if there are some w uh, magical thinking elements or wish fulfillment, you'll know that's coming. Um, Kyle is a football star at his school. His girlfriend of many years is killed in the first few pages. Uh, in a car accident that he thinks is his fault. And he basically comes around to meet this girl, Marley, who really is the perfect girl for him. So she helps guide him and she's suffering a loss from her own of her own. So she helps guide him through um, friendship, love, loss, growing up. He's a selfish brat, you know, when, when the story first starts. And he, through the course of the first half of the book, he learns to grow up and to come into himself and become kind of the best version of who he can be at this age in his life, kind of those growing pains that we all go through, except he goes through it with, a, with someone who is quirky and odd and quiet and sensitive, and turns out she has suffered the loss of her twin sister. So um, they are able to meet each other on this plane where they are joined at their losses and, and fall in love with each other because they're just perfect together and they help each other heal well right on the cusp of them really healing and moving into a deeper part of their relationship Kyle um, wakes up in the hospital and it turns out he's been in a coma for the last you know two weeks and none of that ever happened so he is in love with a girl who they're telling him doesn't exist he is uh, devastated, distraught, He's, but he comes out grown up in a way that his friends don't know him. So they have to kind of reacquaint themselves with, with him. He reacquaints themselves with them, but he's in love with this girl and he is the kind of guy who does not give up on true love. So he is insisting that he's gonna find her. She's out there and, um, and he's gonna make it happen because no one can love that hard and it not be true. This is where the fairy tale element comes in. So uh, that's the only spoiler I'm giving. And then the rest of the book is to be left to reread. And then I'll toss it over to Rachel and let her talk about themes and uh, who this book's perfect for. Definitely. I was, I was so thrilled to be back working with Mickey again on another project. Uh, not only was there a uh, similar writing process to our first book, Five Feet Apart, uh, with Mickey writing the screenplay and my adapting it into uh, the book format, uh, but all this time I would say is absolutely a sister book uh, to our first novel. Uh, it has explorations of grief, uh, of family, uh, in a variety of formats that that comes in, friendship, uh, and most importantly, love. Um, I would say that this is definitely not only a perfect fit uh, for those that fell in love with Will and Stella's story, um, but also it's an ideal fit for 11 to 17 year olds uh, in that age group that maybe haven't previously encountered our work. Um, I would say we really did write it as a book uh, that's perfect for kids kind of transitioning from children's books, uh, fairy tales uh, to young adult. Um, it's great for all readers, but we definitely want booksellers and parents uh, to know that this one is a great fit for, you know, younger tweens, uh, especially at the younger 
section of that 11 to 17 year old age group. Um, there isn't really a bunch of sex <laughs> or drugs, uh, a bit of cursing, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> me and Mickey do curse a bit, but uh, yeah. overall, this is for sure a, a wholesome story at its core, I would say. Definitely. That's, that's what we've got, guys, four minutes. <laughs> Well, great job. Thank you very much. Thank we appreciate you. it. Yeah, and thank you guys for taking taking our book and getting it out there. We Absolutely. Really, really, we, need, we need you and we so appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Agree more. We thank of course you. need you as well and appreciate you and can't wait to get our hands on that book. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melanie, for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. You have a great time. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay, so next up we have Shannon Takaoka. Sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. I, I was practicing it. Um, she is here to talk about her debut book, Everything I Thought I Knew. And that cover is amazing. Thank you. I'll show it. <laughs> um, okay, well, hi, everyone. Um, I, uh, my name is Shannon Takaoka, and I'm here to talk to you about everything I thought I knew. It's coming October 13th from Candlewick Press. So that's just in one week, so I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. It's my debut. Um, it's about a 17-year-old girl named Chloe whose life gets turned upside down by a heart transplant, and it causes her to question everything about who she is and who she wants to be. And um, you just saw the cover. Um, this is the tagline of the book, One Heart, Infinite Possibilities. And as I was writing it, I kind of explored a lot of what if possibilities. Um, but I think the one that most reflects the title is the next slide. Um, what if everything you thought you knew was wrong? That is the question my main character, Chloe, asks herself. And, um, and uh, anyhow, so I wanna tell you a little bit about her as a main character and the story. So um, Chloe's an overachiever. She's in her senior year of high school. She's applying to colleges. She feels like she has her future figured out. Um, and then we find that she collapses during cross country practice and um, they, her doctors discover a hidden heart defect and she has to have a transplant. So uh, next slide. Um, so uh, that's the setup of the book. And then we fast forward to six months after her transplant where everything's different. Chloe is finding it difficult to re-engage with her old life and she's doing all kinds of reckless things. She's giving her medication. She's partying with her new friend, Jane, who she meets in summer school. And even more unsettling um, are recurring nightmares of, of dying and vivid, strange memories that she doesn't recognize as her own. So um, the only place where she feels like she can get out of her head and, and leave all the strangeness behind is in the ocean where she's learning to surf and um, possibly falling for her instructor, whose name is Kai. Uh, next slide. And then, um, but as she and Kai grow closer, her symptoms continue and she becomes convinced that something's going on with her head, her heart, she doesn't know. So as she searches for answers, what she learns will lead her to question everything she thought she knew about life, death, love, and even possibly the nature of reality itself. So that's the synopsis. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about what inspired me to write this book. Um, I had read um, or listened to, I can't remember exactly what the source was, a story about um, how some transplant recipients felt like they'd inherited memories or habits and preferences from their donors. And I just thought that was, whether that's possible or not, I just really thought that was a fascinating thing to think about. And um, that was kind of what inspired me to write the book. And then I was also inspired by some of the multiverse theories that come out of quantum mechanics. So there's uh, definitely um, a physics angle to this book as well. And then finally, um, setting was a big inspiration for me. I live here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you'll definitely find some landmarks uh, from the Bay Area in, the, in a couple scenes in the book, including the Golden Gate Bridge. And yeah, that is um, basically uh, the story of everything I thought I knew. Thank you so much for inviting me here to talk about it. Um, you can find out more on my a website or follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And um, I love 
independent bookstores and I wrote uh, most of this book in my two local Indies cafes, uh, Book Passage in Corte Madera and um, Copperfields in San Rafael. So hello, if any of my local Bay Area people are on and thanks. Nice, Shannon, thank you. See, that wasn't so bad for your first time, right? I know, thanks. <laughs> yeah, very nice. All right, so next up we have Mac Barnett and Sean Harris, which between those two, oh, there are some great hits there. Um, they have their next book coming out called A Polar Bear in the Snow, and I'm very, very excited about it. Thanks, Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Mac <laughs> Barnett. I'm Sean Harris. I'm his illustrator. And I, a lot of you uh, probably know that it's it's most common in picture books that the author and illustrator like don't know each other, don't really communicate. Uh, I think that's the most common outcome. That's not usually how I work, but this is a, this is really different because Sean and I have been friends since we were eight years old. Uh, we have we have photographic proof right there. There we go. Here's here's my uh, multimedia share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is us. We are on the Castro Valley Thunderbolts right there. Uh, I don't think we won anything. I don't think we're like league champions or runners up, right? But Castro Valley, California, by the way, anybody from Castro Valley who has been to Castro Valley, driven through Castro Valley on the way to somewhere else, light it up in the chat. <laughs> Chat's looking pretty dead. Chat's looking pretty dead. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all right. Uh, yeah, so Sean and I have known each other forever. And this book uh, really came out of just us doing what we do all the time, which is like sit around and, and hang out and eat cereal in the middle of the day. <laughs> when, we were, uh, when we were sitting around eating cereal in the middle of the day, I... Um, I had I was reviewing proofs from uh, I think my first book called Her Right Foot, written by Dave Eggers, and it was a it was a book uh, that I illustrated with collage, and there was one spread in the book um, where I had no lines containing uh, containing a, a picture of the Statue of Liberty, uh, and the shadows defined all of these all of these lines for me. I think the paper was kind of. I didn't do a good job of gluing it down. It was separated from the page more than a lot of other pages. And I was like, Mac, look at this. This is so interesting. I was kind of obsessed with the edge that the light was creating um, in, in the print. And so I started experimenting uh, with making some art that relied on light and shadow to create lines and contrast. I was kind of playing around with the idea of doing a polar bear in the snow, I wanted an environment that that was uh, uh, that was really stark and kind of minimal like that. And I was I was asking Mac, I was saying, you know, do do you have how, what would you do with a book? <laughs> if you had this art, how would you make a book? <laughs> so then I took that question as uh, an invitation to to write this book, <laughs> um, and and. <laughs> This is finally we have a book together. So I'm going to read you yeah. just a little bit of this, uh, just a little introduction here. But 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 I'm not going to I'm not going to read you the whole thing. A polar bear in the snow, by me and Sean. There is a polar bear in the snow. Nice nice picture, Sean. How long did that one take you? <laughs> Still asleep, he lifts his nose to sniff the air, and he awakens. There is a polar bear in the snow. Where is he going? Is he going to visit the seals? No, he is not hungry. Is he going to hunker in a cave? No, his fur protects him from the storm. Is he going to eat a, <laughs> is he going to meet a man? No, 
but maybe the former. <laughs> yeah. There is a polar bear in the snow. Where is he going? And that's where we're going to end it. No, 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 show one more, show one more, show one more. Where is he going? No, no, <laughs> wow. no. The people need to look at the book. No, Sean. <laughs> no, I won't. Even Sean. Oh, my Sean goodness. Now, we have a little extra time here. I just, I just want to read some Castro Valley comments that showed up. These are very Castro Valley. We grew up in a small town. Here's somebody's comment. Where? LOL. <laughs> and somebody else said, I lived in Hayward for a few years. That's not Castro Valley. That's just a, a city next to Castro Valley. But that's where we get most of our clothes and food. That's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for hanging out. It's great to see so many familiar names in, in, in that uh, Zoom font from your blacked out cameras. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I can't. Those two if, <laughs> have me giggling over here. That was great. Thank you so much. I loved it. Now Mac Barnett has blacked out his camera. Um, okay, so up next we have Adam Rex, who let me tell you, I discovered him one day um, when I picked up the book, Frankenstein Makes a Sandwich. And I was laughing out loud on the floor. <laughs> And I did not care who was around. I was like, you guys, everyone has to read this book. So funny. I love it. Um, he's here to talk about his next book, On Account of the Gum. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so here, here it is, On Account of the Gum. And I wrote and illustrated this one. And so I want you to get a good look at what's going on in the hair there. And I don't know how to introduce this book without just kind of letting it introduce itself. So I am also, I'm really glad that Mac read a little bit because I was worried I was going to be the only person reading. Uh, so it starts out with, here's our kid. They're in bed, blowing a bubble, a collage of entirely made up gum wrappers behind them because I didn't want to break anybody's copyright uh, restrictions. So I just sort of invented a bunch of gum wrappers that would hopefully be reminiscent of real ones. And here we see she's falling asleep. Eagle eyes will see that the gum is slipping out of her mouth. Next morning, she's groggy, yawning. She doesn't know that she has gum in her hair yet. The cat knows though. The cat sees what's going on and the cat Spurs her to reach up there, find the gum, and that's where the story begins. That's the gum right there that you got in your hair. On account of the gum that you got in your hair, your dad said, sit still, and your sister said, duck, and you sat very still, still the scissors got stuck in the gum that you got in your hair. Okay, we went on some websites and all of them swear if you wanna get scissors and gum out of hair, you take two sticks of butter and smear them along and I see, it appears that those websites were wrong. Don't give me that look. Your aunt said she knew how to get the gum out from this tip in a book she was reading about in the paper or, or something. She couldn't say where. The point is, that's why you have grass in your hair. Now, that's just the beginning. I'm gonna go ahead and spoil the fact that it pretty much snowballs from there. Here we have a page near the end. The fire department has been called. There's a cop. There's one of those dogs that fire people have. There's a bunch of balloons. There's a very powerful fan. There's a guy with bees who's on his way and they're trying everything to get the gum out. And this story began in a pretty ordinary way for these kinds of things. Uh, I was having a conversation with my brother. He was talking about one of my nieces. She had gotten gum stuck in her hair. And whenever I've heard about this, I've always thought, you know, you hear that to get gum out of hair, you're supposed to use peanut butter. And this has never happened to me. So I've never really understood like if the peanut butter gets the gum out, then what do you use to get the peanut butter out? And so that's kind of where this all began. And once I had that idea, I 
well, you know, sometimes I write books that are rhyming books, and sometimes I write books that don't rhyme. And at the beginning of an idea, I, I don't necessarily know which the book is going to be. But the very first line I wrote of this was, that's the gum right there that you got in your hair. And I thought, okay, I guess I, guess I, I rhymed. That doesn't necessarily mean that the whole book has to rhyme, but I rhymed. And the very next line I wrote after that was, on account of the gum that you got in your hair. And I, I think if you, if you have a line like that with a rhythm that sounds like you're about to sing a song about trains or something on account of the gum that you got in your hair, you need to follow that to its logical conclusion. So I decided to, to really embrace that this was gonna be a rhyming book, which was interesting because of course it, it helped dictate what kind of choices I made about the things that went into the hair getting worse and worse um, so that you eventually have, you know, the, the grass gets into the hair, some noodles and bacon get into the hair. They figure that the best way to get the grass out would be to have your pet rabbit eat the grass out, but the rabbit just sat like it thinks it's a hat. And so let's scare the rabbit away by bringing in the cat, but no, the ra rabbit isn't afraid of the cat, but you know what? Oh, I know what to do. It's a little bit mean, but the cat always gets really scared when I clean. Just watch, she'll run off and hide under the bed if the vacuum comes anywhere close to your head. Wait, no, I'm thinking of the old cat. So, so the, the rhymes kind of helped dictate where the story went. And I thought I, that was great because I think it made me um, make choices that I might not have made otherwise. So after I wrote it, then I set about illustrating it and um, so I painted this whole thing on my computer, but, uh, you know, it started out with sketches, of course, because they all do. And sometimes I get a little worried when I have a character or characters that I want to show in a lot of different angles. I'm afraid that they're not going to look consistent. And, and so what I often do actually is make myself models to work from. So here's a couple of those. So here's the cat. The cat is just made out of that kind of like Crayola model magic air dry clay. It was just some clay that my kid had. Um, so, you know, it doesn't lead to the best sculpture, but it's still, it's helpful to, to help me visualize every angle, the cat looking down, the cat looking up and so forth. And then I made a little sculpy head of the kid as well. And I do this a lot. I've done this on a, on a lot of different books. Um, it's comforting. And again, it helps push me out of my comfort zone a little bit so that maybe I'll try uh, an unusual angle or a composition because I have a little bit of reference to, to help guide me on my way to that. Um, so I think that's it for me. I have no idea how long that was, but the book is on account of the gum. This is actually its book birthday. And I understand that everybody was going to sing to me. Yes? Sing? I mean, no? Nobody's singing? I can't. Okay. Well, they're all <laughs> muted. But anyway, today is the day. Uh, so thank you so much for listening and goodbye from Tucson, Arizona. I have one quick question for you. Yeah. Is that a unicorn astronaut in behind you? Uh, that is. That is left over from a, a illustrator draw-off panel that I did the last time I was sitting in front of Zoom doing one of these things. So yeah, that's an ill. That is a unicorn astronaut meeting a walrus on an undetermined surf, planetary surface. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Thank here you to ask asking. important questions today, guys. All right, thank you, Adam. Up next, we have Tanita Davis, who I know does not like to talk about herself, but fortunately loves to write books. And she is here today to talk about her new book, Serena Says. Thank you. Um, in um, 2012, I was um, had just moved back to California after having lived in Scotland for years. and. It was great to be back with family and everything. And the first thing that happened was that my sister was a junior in high school and she started to be ill and we couldn't figure out, you know, just basically what was wrong. And of course I wasn't, you know, living in the same house with her. So it was something that was just sort of on the periphery of my life. And it turned out that her kidney was failing and she ended up missing most of her senior year for uh, being on the kidney transplant list, going through dialysis, and doing all of the things that go along with having chronic kidney problems. And 
that was a very significant change in um, our lives as a family, in, in her life as for who she was. And, you know, she missed a lot of school. She lost time with her friends. And there was this whole transition that took place as she went through, basically, it was all told about, you know, a year and a half, two years that her life sort of had to take a different path. And I recognized that I had not, um, just in passing as, you know, she wanted to get that part of her life over with and behind her as fast as possible as anyone would. And I, you know, years later was thinking, you know, it was all new to us as a family. Everything that we went through, everything that happened was completely new. And I wondered just in passing how strange it must have been for her classmates. Just because she was older, she was a junior and senior in, in high school. But I wondered, you know, people don't know what goes on in a family and what the, you know, sort of goes on with the medical world. And so I thought, you know, I really should write something about this. But as often happens when I sat down to write this book, it, turned and took another lane and went off in an entirely different freeway. So um, I ended up writing a book called Serena Says, which um, also happened to thematically come from a happenstance. Now, I don't remember what talk show it was, but there was this blonde child with a gigantic bow on her head and she was doing some sort of videos. Oh, I wish I could remember her name. I should have thought. But anyway, she was doing, um, I guess maybe she was on Ellen. She's Are you just, talking about JoJo? Yes, there. <laughs> the bow was all I could think of was the bow. It's really big, really big. And I, I just remembered, you know, she sort of has just tons of videos and she was, you know, she's very um, confident, very just pep forward little person. And she was, you know, doing all of this stuff. And so I just, after I'd seen her, I went on the, you know, YouTube and I sort of looked around and I thought, who is this person and what, where'd she come from? And I saw there were a ton of sort of middle grade aged girls who had, you know, sort of, they talked about books or what slime they were making or jewelry and all of this stuff. And I noticed that there was maybe one black girl out of a lot of other people who were doing vlogs or anything. And I thought, well, where are the black girls? Where, where are the voices from other cultures and other people? Why, why is it all, I mean, there was a lot of slime, not gonna lie. But I mean, <laughs> for a while that was kind of all there was anyway. But, you know, and I thought if I had been a kid in middle grade, what would I have talked about? And then I laughed at myself because talking also not my superpower. <laughs> so, I thought about it, and, and so that's where Serena says come. It's sort of a it was a collaboration of two things that happened between my sister and then just seeing JoJo on TV. Um, Serena says is a book about a girl who has always been running to catch up. She was um, sort of bumped ahead grade wise because she was um, scholastically inclined. And so she's the youngest girl in her class. She was the only black girl in her class. She had, um, you know, she's made friends and she's done all of these great things. And, but she's still always sort of trying to catch up. Her best friend is this amazing, bright, funny person who is just amazing to, you know, everyone knows her. But when her friend JC ends up in the hospital with uh, kidney failure, that sort of changes the relationship already. And she's waiting for her friend to come back and she's waiting for her life to start again. And when it does, when her, when her friend is recovering, it turns out she's made a new friend, somebody who was able to be there for her in the hospital. It was just a mistiming of a bad cold, but when somebody has come from an organ transplant, it, it's, I wrote all of this pre, you know, pre-mask world, but that's your life. You don't, you don't see people, you're staying in, you're keeping the germs off of you. And suddenly she didn't have a friend to rely on or to lean on or to shine in that reflected light. And she had to sort of restart her life. She had to stop and think, okay, who am I now without someone who shines brighter and lets me sort of stand in that, in that glow? Um, I think probably of all of the books that I've written, this is, this is one that is, is maybe the most me because I think there's a certain element of my whole elementary and junior high years of just kind of 
observing and and sitting quietly and, and trying to stay out of too much of uh, too much attention and i think that i really just realized how much it resonated with me to think about how many people were like that and i know that that's probably not why there's not a lot of black girls on youtube you know making their own slime and discussing their crafts but i just felt like you know if i had at you know, 11 to 13 been told, hey, find your voice, shine your light, stand up, be seen. What difference would that have made to me? And so that's kind of what I wanted to sort of put out there um, with Serena Says. Um, I have uh, not got a hardback copy of the book yet because it's book birthday is the 3rd of November. So we're all still running around in the pandemic world of paperbacks at the moment. We're really lucky we got these out. Um, but uh, I did want to make sure that everybody could know the adorable Frank Morrison illustration on it because those, the hair is, the hair is everything. Hair and is uh, everything. isn't it? <laughs> and um, I just really want to, um, I really wanted to write this book and just to speak to the people who maybe aren't as shiny and special in their heart of hearts. They think that they're always written in to be the wacky best friend in any script, that you are the star of the show too. That's all Thank I got. You. Thank you, Tanita. That was great. And very important. That's, a, that's very important. We're, we don't want to be sidekicks. We want to be the main character. That's right. Yes. All right. Thank you for that. So next up, we have Beth McMullen. She's the author of Mrs. Smith's Spy School and, the, and uh, sorry, words. And we'll be talking <laughs> about her new series today, Lola Benko, Treasure Hunter. Great, thank you so much for having me. This is, the, um, this is like a great escape from reality. The last couple of weeks have been nuts as everybody knows. So it's nice to get with book people because I, I'm happiest when I'm with book people. So thank you for inviting me to come and talk today. A um, little bit about me real quick. I live in Davis. I've been quarantining with two teenagers, which is why all the gray hair, that's what happens when you quarantine with teenagers. Um, my latest work, the book that I've been working on, there are a lot of scenes of um, the main character trying to escape enclosed spaces. So I really feel like reality is, leaking into my my fiction at this point. Um, I've written for both adults and kids. My last middle grade series, as you mentioned, was Mrs. Smith's Spy School for Girls. There are three of those out. I'm working on um, a summary of the fourth, but I'm struggling with a plot that doesn't involve, you know, a virus running wild in the world, because I know nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to hear about that. So I'm, I'm, I'm moving toward environmental disaster for something, you know, fresh. Um, my latest middle grade is Lola Benko, Treasure Hunter, which came out about a month ago now into this very strange new reality. It took a lot of um, adjusting to figure out how to get people to hear about the book. So I appreciate um, your efforts in helping all of us who are launching books into this uh, strange new reality figure out how to do that best. Um, a little bit about Lola. So I like to think of Lola as a, a modern take on Indiana Jones. If Indiana Jones were a 12 year old girl, uh, the world that Lola lives in is the same one that we all live in, except readers will find there's a touch of magic in there as things go on. And that things we thought were one way are really another. I love the theme of things being other than they appear on the surface, comes up in all of my books. Um, it's also probably why during quarantine, I've been reading a ton of psychological thrillers, you know, that bait and switch where something is one way, but you get a good twist at the end. Um, anyway, so Lola has a world traversing archeologist dad. And that means that she is very, very used to moving around and not putting down roots anywhere. But every day and every hunt for something hidden is an adventure. And no matter what, she and her dad are an unbeatable team. They're very close. Then her father disappears. And the official story is that he was caught in a flash flood in Eastern Europe. But Lola's pretty smart girl. She researches this and realizes that the day in question was perfectly lovely. There were no storms anywhere. 
Besides, Lola would know if he was dead. She'd feel it and she doesn't feel it. But what she does suspect is that his disappearance has to do with a mythical stone he was studying. A stone so powerful that in the wrong hands, it could alter the path of civilization as we know it. So Lola faces the most important hunt of her life, the search for her father. But she's going to need help. And that comes in the form of new friends at school, specifically Jin Wu Rossi, who has his own problems, primary among them that his best friend in the world and his STEM fair partner moved away and ghosted him, kind of broke his heart. So he's, he's a little damaged when Lola meets him. And then there's Hannah Hill, who is a girl who is so focused on perfection, on being the best of the best, that she has totally forgotten how to have fun and enjoy the process. So in searching for Lawrence Benko, these three end up on a fantastical journey that will call into question everything they think to be true about the natural world. And it will teach them that success is going to require teamwork and most importantly, trusting each other. So the second in this series, which is called Lola Benko and the Midnight Market, will be out in August 2021. I just wrapped that up. It was a lot of fun. Um, so who am I writing for? and why. I think about that a lot. So I'm writing for the kid who wants to be transported out of the here and now. And maybe that applies to all of us right now. But um, a kid who's looking for a world of action, adventure, suspense, humor, where you can really escape, and get out of your own head, and get out of your own reality, and just disappear for a while, like a mental vacation. That's who I'm writing for. There are lessons in my books about how to be a good friend, how to be brave, but I like to think those are wrapped up in the excitement of what's going on in the story. I want kids to be on the edge of their seats because that's where I like to be when I read. Um, finally, I started writing middle grade books when my son was reading them when he was young. And while I loved how heart pounding and exciting and fun the books were, I noticed pretty quickly that the action adventure humor space was dominated by boy characters. They were great stories, but that, that stood out to me. Um, so the reason I wrote Mrs. Smith's Spy School for Girls was to put a girl in the driver's seat in that genre, crank the action up as high as it would go, and see how it played out. Um, and it's the same with Lola Benko. I want girls to see themselves defying the odds, going for broke, even if the world they're doing it in doesn't actually exist, it's a fictional universe. I still think it's important to see yourself there on the page, even if the version you see is something aspirational. Um, I wish I'd had more of that as a kid myself. So again, I thank you so much for all the hard work you're doing and helping us in this weird time to get our books out and to get them in front of kids. Um, and I appreciate the chance to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, Lola is giving me a little bit of Tomb Raider, Laura Croft vibe there. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So definitely into that. I've, I've always been a big fan of that. Thank you so much. So up next, we have Cynthia Katahata. Uh, she is a Newbery Medal winning author for her book, Kira Kira, and won the National Book Award for The Thing About Luck. She's here today to talk about her new book, Saucy. Where did Cynthia go? There she is. Okay, there we go. Uh, and I had some slides that were going to be shown. There we go. Uh, so I noticed I'm the only one who needs notes, but I can't remember all this. I have no idea how you all remember everything. Um, anyway, so the main human characters of my new novel, Saucy, is a group of quadruplets. And it's based on this uh, group of quadruplets here who I interviewed, I Skyped with, and I uh, sent many questions to over the months and uh, maybe as long as a year or, or longer. And so in the book as well, there's uh, three boys and a girl. And the girl in the book is named Becca. And Becca is the main character. She's the one who bonds most deeply 
with this little pig, a sick piglet that the kids find by the side of the road. And in real life, life as in the novel, there's a young man, oopsie, we're going a little fast. <laughs> there's a young man um, with cerebral palsy and he's a full and enthusiastic and very active part of the family. And this young man likes to, um, he likes to bowl, but in the book, he's an aspiring songwriter. Uh, so the next slide is, uh, this is the piglet uh, that I pictured as I was writing the book. So Saucy herself looks really different. She's pink, but something about this little piglet here just spoke to me. And so as I was writing, I kept picturing this little one here with the uh, greens hanging out of its mouth. Uh, so the next one is, uh, it's just, uh, you know, one of the things that I found out from interviewing pig people is that the pigs are really super happy and they're very, very intelligent. So some of the details I learned from interviewing was a woman who said her pig goes, ha, 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 when it thinks something is funny. And someone else told me that when her pig, when it wants to say no, it actually says no. And then somebody else told me that another pig, her pig, and I use this one in the book where it's being judgmental. And so it goes, hmm. And so it'll look at you and it'll say so, and it won't know quite what you mean, but it thinks you might be annoyed and it'll go, hmm. So they're very smart. They're just ridiculously smart. Um, and so the next one is they can, they run really fast. Like you think of them as kind of um, maybe even clumsy, but they're actually fairly agile. They can run fast and they can jump quite high. Like I've seen video of them jumping over fences. Um, and so oh, the next one is an illustration from the book and uh, they take Saucy to get some food, but she drops her, uh, the girl Becca drops the pig by accident. And um, they love bananas. Like this one woman told me that she went out of town and her husband was with her pig and her husband forgot that at a certain time every day, the pig got a banana. So he kept walking into the kitchen and the pig was there for like an hour, just waiting for this banana that never came. And so later he mentioned to her that while she was out of town, every day at this one time, the pig would be in the kitchen for an hour. And it was because he, you know, she, he didn't know he was supposed to give the pig a banana. Uh, so the next one is a picture of Gia Como which is the pet pig of a woman named Alex I interviewed. And she talked a lot about just how deep her pig's love is for her and how deeply she loves her pig. Uh, so the next one is just her cuddling her little, her little baby piglet. Uh, I, he was uh, not as wild, like some of the piglets uh, are extremely destructive. They'll just rip your house apart. But hers, she said, isn't that bad. Um, that they love, uh, like, I saw these pictures once and this is a this is a pig when the doorbell bell rings and the pig is just lying sleeping. And then this is a pig when you open a bag of potato chips across the house and the pig is immediately alert and runs across the house because they can hear food being opened from across the house. Um, so the next one is um, just, you know, Becca really, really bonds with this little piglet and she previously she didn't really know who she was as a young girl. She didn't know what she wanted to do and what kind of person she was. And she found this piglet and it just told her who she was. And, and I think, you know, one of the things for me with animals is I feel like they, they help, they've transformed me in so many ways. I've seen them transform my teenage son and, and he has friends who come over and they see our dog Wilson and this, his friends are like, they all play hockey, they're macho, they're swaggery, and they literally will lie on the floor with this dog going, I love you, I love you, just because the, the animals transform you so much. Um, so the next one is uh, pigs of a woman I interviewed, and the one after that is the same, one of those same pigs, and this is a therapy pig, and it goes to these care homes and just, you know, people pet pet the pig and it, it just, they, a lot of them just love the pig. Some of them don't love it as much, but some of them really love it. Um, and her pig loves to paint. So he, um, the next one has him uh, just, this is the kind of paintings he does. Um, so let's see, the next one is 
this is uh, Alex's husband, and he's walking. There are two dogs and Giacomo. And Giacomo doesn't need a leash. In the book, um, I have them using a leash all the time because some of them are not very well trained. Um, so the next illustration is her. It's an illustration from the book, and she's crying because the pig is getting so big uh, that her mom has said, you're going to have to give it away pretty soon. It's destroying things in the house. And it turns out that it's a farm pig, which they hadn't known when they found it. And so it's going to be like 600 pounds. Um, so the next one is, oh yeah, pig in a bath. Um, it's hard to get them in there. <laughs> and I guess they, they, when you first do it, if they don't like the bath, they scream and they scream extremely loudly. And so the next one is an illustration of, um, this is something that happened to that previous woman where the first time she washed her pig, it screamed like somebody was killing this pig. And so people called the police and the police came and uh, wanted to see what was going on and they showed uh, the police the pig. Uh, so the next one is, this is the real life family um, on Halloween. And so one of the things I kept reading about quadruplets is that sometimes they just instinctively almost have a sixth sense where they just know things about each other. And actually um, only one of these said that they just know what's going on with their brother, even if, if, if they're in another room. The other ones were like, yeah, I'm a quadruplet, meh. But um, so two of them were very, very close. Uh, so the next one is, um, the kids, you know, they just sit around, they love the pig, they all love the pig, Becca loves it the most, and they all do something different. One of the boys plays hockey, one is a songwriter, one is a, a math whiz who thinks he's living in a computer simulation, and then there's Becca who's just totally in love with her pig. Um, so the next one is just, um, there's a lot of illustrations in the book, and so the New York Times review was just about how there's kind of a change maybe hopefully in the industry where middle grade books, middle grade novels have more illustrations in them. So this one has a lot of illustrations. Um, the next one is, I think it's an amazing picture of Alex and Giacomo. And cause they have their majestic German shepherd in the back. And she says that her pig loves to kiss her. So they do that a lot, I guess. But uh, he's very cuddly and he's, very he just likes her like he, he 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 likes her husband but he loves her um so the next one is uh the pig saucy gets weighed sometimes because they're obsessed with how much this pig weighs because once it gets too big you know they do have to give it away and so some days she's just uh, becca just does not want to um you know to weigh the pig because she doesn't want to ever give it away but uh inevitably you know they you know the pig just keeps getting bigger so the next slide is this is what the pig could end up being and uh becca's grandmother lives in the house and she's not that uh i mean she's in good health but she's still elderly and then um you know they have her brother who you know, he, he usually he gets around the house by crawling. He keeps the uh, his wheelchair outside like the real family does. But so you really can't have a pig this size in the house. Obviously, you can't. Um, so the next one is um, so they find out that the pig comes from a factory farm. And we kept it really lighthearted because, um, you know, this is a really hard year for kids. And so it's it's actually very, you know, it's an upbeat and cheerful book, but it is kind of about, um, in the end, you know, factory farm pigs. And, and it does ask the question implicitly, not explicitly, just, you know, how should we raise um, food animals really? So the next one, which um, this is just the real factory farm. And then the next one is just the illustration in the book. And this is the only illustration actually from inside the factory farm because we wanted to keep it, we just didn't want it to be depressing. So even though the next one is depressing, there's nothing like this in the book, but I just wanted to include this slide because every time you see this, it's so stunning to me. Like this is how they slaughter these little pigs. They just like slam them on the ground. And so I just, um, even though we kept the book really upbeat, 
this is to me kind of what is underlying it and what made me want to write the book. Um, so the last slide is just, um, I, I, after my dog, I had this dog I loved so much and her name was Sarah and she died and somebody sent me this quotation afterwards and I have it framed in my house. So I just wanted to read a part of it. Um, we need another and a wiser and perhaps a more mystical concept of animals. In a world older and more complete than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with an extension of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren, they are not underlings, they are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. And so to me, the story of Saucy is kind of that quote, except for eight to 12 year olds. <laughs> so here's the book. Um, there's a lot of illustrations in it and uh, it's for younger kids than I usually write for. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Cynthia. Next, we'll have, we're will have we having Stephen Banks. Uh, he is a best-selling writer and was the head writer on SpongeBob SquarePants. He's here to talk about his second book in the Middle School Bite series, Tom Bites Back. Hello there. Good morning. Thank you very much for having us all here. I have my cup from one of my favorite indies, Once Upon a Time in Montrose, California. Uh, anyway, yes, the book I have is... Uh, Middle School Bites, this is number two, Tom Bites Back. First one, there it is, uh, is about a boy, Tom, who is very nervous about starting middle school. And the day before he starts, he gets bitten by a vampire bat, a werewolf, and a zombie. Yes, he is all three. He hits the trifecta of uh, creatures and so forth. And... It's, uh, it's discovered and no one hides it and they announce it at school and they say here at Hamilton Middle School, we accept everyone and uh, he goes about it. So it's not a book about him hiding it or, or whatever, but he has to deal with it. And when I'm ready on this series, there's a great quote by Terry Gilliam, the uh, co-founder of Monty Python, the great writer and director, um, where he said, I make jolly entertainment with serious motives. Now, there are a lot of heavy middle school books, and some of them are some of the best books written. Um, but I wanted to go at it in a different way with doing a funny, entertaining, fast-moving book series. But it does touch upon some of these elements. Now, Tom is a Vam Wolf Psalm. He comes up with that name. And the fact that he is different, looks different, acts different, he makes him sort of universally relatable to anyone who's felt like that while you're going through middle school. Now, in the second book, Tom Bites Back, he meets, big spoiler alert, he meets the vampire bat who bit him, who actually is a girl right here, Martha Livingston, who was bitten in 1776 in Philadelphia when she was 13 years old. And uh, she, of course, now is 257 years old, but she still looks 13 years old because those are the vampire rules. Um, and I follow them with all the monsters. Um, anyway, so Tom is thrilled because not only can she help him with uh, his homework about, he's doing a report on Ben Franklin because she actually waited on Ben Franklin. She was a server girl, but she can finally teach him how to turn into a bat and fly, which he does. He's not very good at it, it takes a while. At one point he has a run in with an owl who is the predator of bats. They're not all friendly like Hedwig in uh, Harry Potter. Um, also in the, uh, second book, this one, uh, Tom Bites Back, he, um, uh, there's a Halloween sequence, how timely, uh, where he, for the first time gets to wear a costume and doesn't look like what he normally looks like. So it's a unique experience for him where he can dress up like as a scary clown, go out trick-or-treating and no one knows who he is. He's, you know, this kid that everyone knows as a Van Wolf Psalm. Um, and who he chooses to dress as is Vincent Van Gogh. Why do you ask? Because he's trying to impress a girl he likes, Annie. And uh, he thinks also he may win the Halloween contest. Let me show you one of these sketches. Mark Fearing is the illustrator. And also the book is filled with illustrations. Here is his rough, which I think is very cool. Um, there is Tom when he meets Martha Livingston, who is very smart. 
uh, and very, uh, a, a very unique character, which was really fun to write. On Halloween, um, one now, in a way, Tom, it's almost like he has a superhero powers because he can fly, he can turn into a bat. He's very strong, because remember, he's also part werewolf. Uh, the zombie part, there are no benefits to being a zombie. You're slothful, you move around slow sometimes, and you're very hungry. But vampires can hypnotize. And so there is a segment in the Halloween section where Tom's best friend, Zeke Zimmerman, uh, is hypnotized. And there he's watching as that happens, which Tom also learns to do. Uh, yes, there is a bully in the book because bullies are real and people deal with them uh, named Tanner Gant. Uh, but I wanted to show the other side of bullies, why someone is a bully. And Tanner Gant pictured here, uh, Tom discovers he goes out at night and sits by himself on the swings. And later we find out why he does these things. And uh, there's a big spoiler alert, which I won't tell you, which comes in the third book, which is coming up. But uh, also in this one, uh, Tom being a zombie and hungry has to take care of his sister Emma's pet mouse. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, he actually eats the mouse. But don't be alarmed because he does regurgitate it. If it comes up, it's fine. And there actually were people who did that, who uh, there were acts, vaudeville acts, where people would swallow mice and things and do that. So we make it all believable. For, we're very realistic here at Middle School Bites. Um, but he is kind of disgusted he did that and there's a big hunt for it and so forth. So anyhow, um, my five minutes has wrapped up here. Um, anyhow, that's the book. Thank you very much for having all of us here. And, you know, let's keep people reading. My goal is to get people to read, as you can see, look, like, see illustrations, illustrations, illustrations. Um, and keep reading and keep selling those books. And man, I know it's tough, but uh, hang in there, as my father used to say. Anyway, thanks again very much for letting us yap about our books. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we have uh, Glenn Zipper and Elaine Monjan. They're here to talk about their space thriller, Devastation Class. Hi, I'm Glenn Zipper. This is Devastation Class. I'm Elaine Munson. Hello, hello. Thanks so much for having us. And um, our book is about Van Wolf Zoms as well. What, what are the odds? This is really embarrassing. <laughs> Um, but seriously, um, I, it's actually deeply intimidating to be around all of you accomplished writers. This is our first book, um, so like, we have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. We come out of um, the film world. Um, I'm a documentary producer. I, I most recently produced Challenger, The Final Flight, which is on Netflix. And when I talk about that, I, talk, I can actually sound like I know what I'm doing. But now, it, as it relates to books, not really. So, so bear with us. And we just um, we'll do our best as we go through this. Um, uh, the, the premise of Devastation Class, we've always struggled to sort of uh, boil it down to a log line. And then Seth Graham Smith, who wrote on um, Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, uh, read it and said, it's Star Trek meets a John Hughes movie. And we said, well, of course, we should have thought of that. And I think it's probably from 30,000 feet the, the best way to describe it. But uh, the narrative is about two groups of young men and women. Um, one group is a, a group of elite military cadets, and the other group is uh, just some civilian students. And they're on a starship in the distant future going on a mission of science and learning. And because this is a rip-roaring science fiction soap opera thriller, of course, there's an alien attack. And when the aliens attack, uh, our military cadets decide that they need to mutiny to take over the ship to save themselves and everybody that they love. And as terrifying as the alien invasion may be, they soon find out that the reality of uh, what's happening is much more terrifying than simply a, an alien invasion. Um, and uh, parallel to that, the conflict from without is the conflict from within. We have this the group of students who didn't sign up for this mutiny and they're not too happy about uh, the fact that, the, that these uh, cadets have taken over the ship and, and taken their fates in their hands. Um, so we have, um, two groups, two diametrically opposed groups um, who couldn't be any more different, um, who are fighting uh, an enemy uh, that threatens them both, um, and they'll need to come together to survive. And if only there was something happening in the real world that was allegorical to um, two very different factions uh, having to face an existential threat, they need to cooperate to survive. I, I can't, it would just 
can't imagine something like that happening right now. Um, I'll hand the ball over to Elaine to talk about uh, the book being um, clean teen and the multiple perspectives. Uh, we're in the heads of different characters. And I think the one thing that it's also, it's also fun uh, to note is because this book was written for adults and kids, we made sure that it was something of a treasure hunt. It's the first book in a, in a trilogy. So we planted Easter eggs throughout the book. And um, what's funny is as uh, our adult friends and their children are reading the book, we're discovering that the children are finding the Easter eggs much more quickly than the parents are, which has been, which has tickled us a bit. But Elaine, why don't I hand the baton to you? You can talk a little bit more about those themes and those perspectives. Well, we have four different characters telling the story. Um, so, uh, you know, we're alternating those perspectives and uh, um, we decided to do it that way because we actually started off um, thinking about it, uh, writing it. We wrote it in the third person originally and decided that it was a much better way to approach it if we actually had personal um, introspective and uh, we could relay the personal experiences of these four characters. Um, so three of them are actually cadets and one of them is a student. So we, we do have the student's perspective as well. Um, and we just thought it was really important um, to have all the voices telling the story. Um, the origin of the book, this came together um, with the fun fact that Glenn and I actually used to be a couple. And on our very first date, we bonded over our mutual love of all things genre, but specifically sci-fi. And so much to the point where our, on that first date, we had, uh, it turned into an overnight binge watch of Battlestar Galactica, the Ron Moore version. So we are big nerds. <laughs> um, and, Pretty early on in our relationship, we realized because we both had been working, you know, um, producing other people's film and television projects and, and getting other people's visions off the ground, we really wanted to have a shot at telling our own story. And so we started brainstorming and decided that we were going to actually um, come up with a TV show concept, which is the origin of Devastation Class. It started as a TV show called California, actually, uh, which is the name of the flagship um, starship in the book. Um, shortly, kind of, you know, six months into the process, we showed it to uh, a friend of mine who designs book jackets, uh, for was designing book jackets for a living at the time. And he read it and said, you know, if you don't want, if this can't be a TV show, why don't you think about it as a YA book? Because it's perfect. So set, that actually set the course. And we found a tremendous amount of freedom, um, creative freedom in being able to write it as, as a book because it's you know essentially just us and an editor, which has been a very interesting process for us um, compared to working in film and television where we're collaborating happily, but collaborating with many, 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 many people. Um, so, um, and you know, the reason we wanted to tell this particular story, our core element um, started off as teenagers fending for themselves aboard a, um, a starship, a sort of Lord of the Flies in space. Um, and we drew upon inspiration that we loved, including Star Wars and Star Trek and um, a movie that some of you may have heard of called Taps from 1981. <laughs> um, so um, that's sort of the backstory of the, of the book. And um, it is also, it's a clean teen book. Um, so um, there is, there's, there's no sex, you know, the sort of the, the violence is, you know, all sort of, you know, uh, hyper sci-fi violence. There's not, not realistic violence. Um, and um, also the two main protagonists are male and female. So the, the alternating perspective, the two primary alter, alter, uh, alternating perspectives are a male voice and a female voice, you know, with Elaine embodying one of them uh, more than me and me embodying the other more than her. But, you know, we had sort of our dueling conflicts as we were writing the book and those manifested in the in the dueling perspectives as they related to our main characters, JD and Viv. So we think both male and female writer uh, readers 
uh, alike will um, be able to identify with these characters and enjoy the journey. And we also wanted to have a, a female as one of the protagonists, just so that we could normalize women in leadership roles. Um, so that, you know, young women reading the book and young men reading the book could, could see, um, see themselves in these people and find it aspirational as well. Um, so I think um, we can kind of wrap it up by sharing our um, animated cover, um, which we'll show you right now. It's Ooh. lagging. Is it? I saw it's it. A little bit. Trust us, it's, it's a little bit cooler than you're looking at <laughs> right now. It's yeah, actually, there's ooh, definitely ooh. a lag. Sorry about that. There's a lag. There's actually a, um, we uh, worked with this amazing artist named Michelle Holm, um, who is best known for her work designing um, uh, album covers for Bruce Springsteen. And she um, came up with the art and, um, and then we actually decided to animate it. So we worked with an animator named Brandon Malberg and a composer named Starkadian to do the music. Um, and the, uh, the non-lagging version can be seen on our website, uh, devastationclass.com. And, um, and you can find us there. Our, our uh, Twitter and Instagram handles are there as well. Thank you so much. Um, I. I don't it didn't lag for me it looked very cool oh cool um, oh good and, yeah look it, it was it was great also fun nerd fact is that i have a Battlestar galactica tattoo <gasps> uh, uh, okay. oh what boy is what is it i'm not gonna say where is it but what yeah. is it? Well, it's, on, it's on my arm if i didn't okay. have this on i'd show it to you but it, it's it's the tattoo um that uh they get when they when I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but instead of getting rings, they get this tattoo together. Yes. 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 Oh, Very cool. that's awesome. That's awesome. All right, you're you're a made woman. You're an official nerd. Join the, <laughs> totally. the, Thank you. Go to the clubhouse and the treehouse later. <laughs> we also thank wanted to say just to wrap it up thank you very much. Um, in times of COVID, you know, launching a book for the first time has been a kind of strange experience and and to have an opportunity like this to present to uh, you know all of the you as booksellers is really important to us um so thanks very much thank you appreciate it all right so our last author for this session today is lillian rivera she is an award-winning author of YA novels and she's here to talk about her new book never look back Hi, um, good morning and, and thank you so much um, for everyone who's, who stayed. <laughs> and um, I don't have a Battlestar Galactica uh, tattoo. I'm, I feel horrible, um, <laughs> but I do have a book. <laughs> it's, um, it's called uh, Never Look Back. It's a, a young adult retelling of the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice. It's set in the Bronx and um, and parts of Puerto, and Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico. I am originally from the Bronx, but I've lived in Los Angeles for 20 years. Um, my parents are still waiting for me to move back. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> so I love LA. Um, uh, my books are Skylight Bookstore and Bromance. And um, so I'll just talk a little bit about Never Look Back. Um, <clears throat> the book is, um, uh, and I'll just go back a little bit to the inspiration first. Um, in 2017, Hurricane Maria kind of landed in Puerto Rico. And I have a lot of family in Puerto Rico, still aunts and uncles and cousins. And um, I was happening to be on book tour and I was visiting my family in New York. And we were watching the hurricane kind of come in. And um, during those, the weeks that led and maybe even the weeks, weeks that led afterwards, I, we had a missing uncle who was 80 years old and we couldn't find him. And I had to take to social media to, can someone please help him? He's in this little space in the mountains of Puerto Rico and we can't get a hold of him and the phone lines are down and all of this was happening. And then you could, you know, if you guys were watching the news at the time, you know what happened with our government and how they tried to, you know, sort of not help my people. And, um, and I was full of despair and I was depressed. And I didn't know how, what to do. And I couldn't write. <laughs> I didn't really know how to react. We did find my uncle, actually a stranger helped find him. Um, he showed us an Instagram video of him. He gave him water and, um, and medical supplies. 
Um, but I didn't really know where to put this despair. So someone told, my sister told me that you, she should, she kept on thinking about this movie that we watched when, when I was like a little kid, like 10 years old. I watched the 1950s film called Black Orpheus. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a retelling of the Greek myth and it's set in Brazil during Carnival. And um, it has beautiful music and this beautiful you know, setting. And the, um, that really spoke to me when I was really young. I, I saw my family in, in those, the characters that were played um, for some reason, everything looked familiar. So I wanted to, so my sister was like, what about Black Orpheus? What about Orpheus? You know, and I was just like, okay. So I, re, you know, I decided that my way of dealing with um, despair and depression was re really writing towards hope and writing towards love, <laughs> which is up there. Um, and so I really wanted to write this story about um, Fierce and Yudi, and it's, an it's told in alternating points of view. So Fierce is a wannabe bachata singer um, who, who loves to woo the girls, you know, he has a gift of, of song. And, um, and he, you know, his summers are really basically just that, of just being able to hang out by the beach and, you know, hang out with his off again, you know, on again girl, um, and just kind of live freely, you know, not really taking his gift or his talent seriously. And then he meets Yudi. And Yudi is a displaced, um, she's displaced from um, Hurricane Maria from her home of Puerto Rico. She's moved to Tampa, but is now being sent to uh, the Bronx, New York to, uh, um, to overcome her depression, right? She just needs a new, new environment is what her mom says. And so she's, but the thing with Yudi is not only is she suffering from PTSD from Hurricane Maria, surviving Hurricane Maria, is that she is actually being uh, pursued by a spirit and his name is Ato. And so then Yudi is dealing with this aspect of like, she, is, she needs help, you know, professional help, but she's also dealing with a true spirit that's following her. And so she meets, um, Fierce meets Yudi and they fall in love, you know, and I don't know, I needed love. <laughs> I really did. At the time I needed it. And so then I wrote about it and it's told in alternating points of view. Um, for the most part, the book doesn't really have, you know, there's no sex. I didn't really want to write about um, curse words or anything like that. I really just wanted to really fall into this, this space of uh, these two young kids who have a lot going on. Um, they're Afro-Latino, you know, obviously you could tell by the cover. Um, and that's another thing that was super important to me is that I really needed um, to see Afro-Latino young people on a cover. <laughs> I really wanted to write about that love. I don't think we see that enough. Um, and so, yes, it's told through alternating points of view. It follows along the Greek myth of Orpheus and Eurydice for the most part, um, but I needed to to do a, my Latinx uh, remix for it. <laughs> so you get a lot of bachata music and you and I wanted to really play up this idea of um, they both having to overcome, you know, using their own strength to overcome these obstacles. They, whether those obstacles are, um, you know, angry spirits or obstacles of just being a young person, a black, a young black person walking the streets of New York. And so there is um, quite questions, you know, these themes of uh, generational trauma and uh, themes about, you know, you know, what your parents look like to you and how, the, how you view them. Um, but there's also this idea of believers and non-believers. And I loved playing around with that. Um, I think in the acknowledgements page, I talk about the high risk of uh, 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 t uh, t uh, suicide rates for La Latinas specifically, and it's a big deal. I wrote an S I, I actually wrote a, a piece for for it for like Cosmopolitan a few years ago, and then the, st the stats hasn't changed yet. So it was kind of important for me to be able to write about this idea of seeking professional help is important. You know, is not a, a bad thing. You know, this was something that I was told when I was young that, oh no, you don't talk to any strangers about your problem, you keep it all, you just pray. <laughs> and so I wanted to be able to, you know, use, you know, this, not use this character, but bring this conversation that young people can have about what it look, you know, what does it look like to seek 
help, but also and to believe and to and to pray <laughs> that both those things can exist. And so if you've ever seen, um, I got had a chance to do this. Um, Hades Town is a Broadway musical about the Greek myth, uh, which is really wonderful. I, I loved it, but I, I wanted to do my kind of like Latinx ver version of it. So there's a, a Spotify uh, playlist that, that's on Spotify with uh, the book that I think really helps when you're reading it because it, it does add a lot of music in it. A lot of bachata, bachata is very uh, Dominican, it's from Dominican Republic. There's, you know, there's Bad Bunny. If you don't know Bad Bunny, I don't know, you should find out. <laughs> because he's amazing. And, uh, and then Prince too, because Prince plays a, a big role in, in the movie. I mean, in the book, not in the movie. <laughs> and um, so yes, it's uh, Never Look Back. It's told in alternating points of view. Um, there's, you know, the underworld is definitely in there. You know, I, I had a lot of fun playing around with Caribbean myths and folk tales and kind of mixing that up a little bit. So this is a, it's a great book for, Someone who loves Greek mythology is a great book for someone who's never even heard of Orpheus and Eurydice and maybe just wants a love story um, mixed with a little bit of, of scary stuff. <laughs> and, um, and I think that's it. So it, was, it literally, it, it was my love letter to the Bronx, my love letter to Puerto Rico, and also just um, my book about love because <laughs> I needed it. I think we still need it right now. <laughs> and so um, I think that's it. So uh, yeah, never look back. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lilam. That sounds great. And yes, we do definitely still need love. Yes, for sure. We need it. Um, and I appreciate you putting Afro-Latina uh, or, or Latino uh, kids on the cover. That is something that we for sure still need as well. Uh, well, that is our session today. Oh, I did take off, I took off my, my cardigan and this is the Battlestar Galactica tattoo. I don't know if you can see it, but there you go. Big nerd. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming to the session. We've got another session coming up in about five minutes or so, if you want to stick around for that. It was great having you all here and hearing about your new books. Can't wait to get my hands on them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.